Legends of Wasteland City is a post-apocalyptic anthology series and may contain references to drugs, sex, and violence along with the occasional vulgarity. You've been warned. Dukes of the Nuke, The Ones Who Came Before, Chapter 6. Come on, boy. Mutt ran to catch up with Zinn. The dog joined them, running alongside, then made his way ahead as they ran down the sandy hill. They were halfway across the valley when the raiders crested the hilltop behind them. Mutt and Zinn didn't look back but heard a loud bang over their heads. They looked over their shoulders and saw a bright red flare in the sky. There'll be more of them soon. They're calling in reinforcements. Mutt could barely speak over his lost breath, but managed to reply. Keep running! The Duke's camp is on the other side of the valley! They ran even harder, the dog leading the pack. He'd run up ahead, then circle back as the two ran for their lives to keep up. There was no wash or trail on this side of the mountain, and twice, Mutt got too close to a bramble bush, scratching deep gashes in his legs, but he didn't even feel them. From this far in the valley, Mutt could see back to where the highway was. It was far, almost a mile, but they'd be visible to anyone on the road who was looking for them. A second flare was launched behind them, and as the explosion echoed through the valley, they could hear the faint sounds of engines toward the road. This is gonna be close! They were both breathing heavily as they came to the outcropping of cliffs on the far side of the valley. There! Mutt pointed to a spot where the rock face broke. There was an opening in the cliff and a dirt road leading straight into the mountain. The road was lined with old broken down cars and military vehicles, mostly shells now after years of being torn apart for scrap, with a clear serpentine path down the middle of them. They left the soft dirt of the open desert and turned on the dirt road toward the opening in the mountain. The engines of two blood dirt bikes revved behind them, trying their best to catch the two before they got in range of the Duke's defenses. Mutt turned and saw them closing in fast, spilling big clouds of exhaust and dust that followed behind. Hey! Help! As they ran up the road, Zinn could see that the rock walls were abutted by two tall guard towers draped in camouflage on either side, with a chain-link fence barricaded with tires, metal, and piled cars spanning the entire opening. Between the two towers were some wires that strung a sign between them with large letters spelling out Duke's Nukes a makeshift billboard that could be seen from the freeway as wastelanders made their way through the desert. In front of the barricade was a number of tank stoppers, jersey barriers, and a bus with no wheels laying on the ground flanking the middle opening. A pair of large machine guns guarded by short piles of sandbags were built into the wall on either side below the towers. It was a full-on army base. As they ran closer, they could see a guard in each tower with a smaller machine gun trained out at the raiders behind them. On the left, Mutt recognized Hardass. On the right, Jackhammer, two of the Duke's most formidable guards. Mutt yelled out again. Help us! They heard gunshots from behind them. The raiders were shooting from the back of their motorcycles. Then all at once, the Duke's weapons lit up. Mutt and Zinn could hear the bullets flying over their heads as they ran, and the motorcycle's engines revved as they turned to dodge the bullets. The dog ran unaffected just ahead of them, clearing the way to the base. There were more gunshots from behind as the raiders shot back wildly at the towers. Mutt gave one last look to the left and saw the two raiders on foot closing in. The chain link fence was just 30 or 40 yards ahead, but he felt surrounded. The dukes in the towers fired repeatedly as Mongo took his spot on the 50 caliber machine gun behind the sandbag wall. Mongo was the head of the guards known as the MPs, the duke's own security force, and was a giant of a man. He handled the large machine gun like it was a children's toy. Across from him, Bacon, an MP even larger than Mongo, took his spot on the other 50 caliber gun. Open the gate! Mongo yelled, firing through the fence at the two motorcycles. One of the bikes turned suddenly, crashing down into the dirt. The other swerved around, gunning his throttle. He wasn't giving up. The two bloodbacks running through the valley reached the line of cars and ducked down behind an old military ambulance, pulling out guns of their own and shooting back at the camp. Another Duke hot shot ran up from behind the cover of the sandbag walls and opened the gate just in time to let the trio through. The dog was first, followed by Zinn, but as Mutt passed through the gateway, he felt something hot poke him in the side. Ah. Uh. He fell down hard onto the dirt, shot. Uh. Uh. Zinn turned around and saw Mutt fall to the ground and quickly ran to pick him up and pull him through the gate. Hot shot swung the gate closed and ran over to one side of Mutt while Zinn grabbed his other side. Picking him up and each taking an arm over their shoulders, they carried him deeper into camp, 
with bullets firing in all directions over their heads. The second motorcycle rider made a suicidal charge down the center of the ruined cars and quickly went down in an explosion of dust and fire. The two bloodbacks behind the old ambulance fired blindly while hiding behind its empty engine compartment. Bullets riddled through the old metal, piercing fist-sized holes through the fender, and the two bloodbacks fell in a puddle of blood, practically on top of each other. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! Mongo yelled over the constant booming of jackhammer and hard-ass punching new holes in the dead bodies of the four raiders. The barrels of each weapon smoked as they stopped shooting and began to cool. Hard-ass yelled down from the west tower. We've got another one by the road! On a dirt bike! Zin looked up just in time to see the flash of a sniper rifle come from a ledge above her. It hit the gas tank! But he's running! The blood back on the dirt bike took off west on the old freeway, back toward the blood back's camp. Hotshot and Zin carried Mutt deeper into camp. Zin looked around, half in shock, but taking in as much as she could. There was an open courtyard in the middle of the camp, and on either side were rows of old military tents, and makeshift huts made from the scrap parts of the vehicles out front. There were walls of sandbags protecting each one, along with stacks of wooden boxes piled high all around the camp. Past this middle area was the sheer cliff face of the mountain, but with giant metal elephant doors on the ground protected by a thick concrete frame all around. It was an old military bunker. This must be where the Dukes were finding their steady supply of weapons to sell. Across from the tents, but before the large doors, there was a small cinder block building which had cables running out of its side, leading in different directions around camp, and one large cable running up the mountain. On the top of the mountain face, there was a radio tower, high above the camp. Mutt was already in shock, and could barely speak. The bag. It's in the bag. By now, the entire tribe of Dukes and several others were gathering in the courtyard of the camp, except Hardass and Jackhammer, who stayed at their posts in case more raiders showed up. The Duke's leader, War Chief Grimm, walked out of his tent to see what was happening. Plenty of raider clans had made a run on the Duke's camp before, and Grimm was unfazed by all the noise. He was smoking a cigarette and had a scraggly beard that hung beneath his aviator-style sunglasses. He surveyed the scene and saw Mutt being held up by Hotshot and a girl he didn't know. Hotshot spoke first. He's been shot, Chief. The war chief took one look at Mutt, being held up by his second-in-command and the unfamiliar girl. Vash! Vash was not only the tribe's barter master, but also their best medic. Already on it, chief. Vash pushed through the crowd with his first aid pack over his shoulder. He gave Mutt a quick look over. Keep pressure on that wound. We need to get him to the med tent. Vash took the shoulder Zin was carrying, letting Mutt's bag fall to the ground, and he and Hotshot walked Mutt off quickly into a large green tent with a rough red cross painted on it. Clean water! and light a fire. Vash yelled out as they disappeared into the tent with Mutt. A few of the Dukes heard the order and ran in different directions to get the needed supplies. The dog tried to follow Mutt into the medical tent but couldn't figure out how to get through the flap. He started pacing around the med tent trying to find a way in. Grim looked over at Mongo, standing alongside Bacon, awaiting any next orders. You fellas okay? All good, sir. The boys didn't mind a little target practice. Good. They'll probably send another wave. Let's be ready. Grim headed back to his tent. And go get those guns! Copy that. Mongo told Bacon to gather up some dukes and see what the raiders had brought them. Bacon pointed to three standing nearby. Bullet! Big Spoon! Blue! You're with me! <laughs> B squad. The four dukes, each with their own weapons, headed toward the front of camp. Mongo looked up to Valhalla's sniper perch on the cliffside. You missed! He said it just loud enough for everyone to hear. Valhalla was swatting at something on her legs. Fire ants! She tore off her jacket and started undoing her belt. Shit! Fit my fucking legs! Valhalla pulled her pants down to her boots and swatted away the invading army. Some of the scruffier Duke's cat called and whistled, but Valhalla just flipped them off and pulled her pants back up. Mongo put his head in his hand as he walked toward the war chief's tent. Zin stood in place and watched all this happen, not knowing what to do next. She found herself standing alone in the middle of camp. She looked down, saw Mutt's pack on the ground and picked it up. She thought that she should go and make sure Mutt was going to pull through when she felt a hand on her shoulder. She turned around to see a dark bearded face looking at her with an almost joyful smile. 
The man was dressed in robes, with a wide-brimmed hat casting a shadow across his eyes. Well, did he get it? Zin tried to process this question, seemingly out of nowhere. What? The radio parts, child, so I can continue my work. Zin looked at the man confused. She thought, how could this man be so unmoved by the fact that she just carried one of his tribe through the gates, bleeding out? She waited a moment to see if he had anything else to say, but he just stared at her expectantly with that unbroken grin. She pulled open the pack and fished out the small blue bin that Mutt had taken from the radio room where she was held just earlier that day. Grabbing the bin ceremoniously, the robed man looked right into Zin's eyes. His sacrifice will not be in vain. He took the bin with him and walked toward the cinder block building with the wires that led up the mountain toward the radio tower. Zin stood there once again, in the middle of the courtyard not sure what to do. Should she follow this robed man or go make sure that Mutt was okay? She decided to believe that Mutt would be fine, and she didn't want to get in the way, so she walked toward the cinder block building that the rogue man just walked into. Approaching, she could see Wasteland Radio painted crudely over the door. She turned the handle, opened the door, which didn't make a sound as it swung on its large metal hinges, and walked inside. Zin entered into a small foyer, complete with a desk and chair, which both seemed to be made of recycled materials. On the walls were shelves full of all sorts of items from the old world. A coffee maker, small plastic trophies with men and women playing different sports on them, some musical instruments, records, cassette tapes, and a whole bunch of stuff that Zin didn't recognize. A song that she had heard a thousand times before on the radio in her camp was softly playing from a room down the hall that spanned the rest of the small building. Zin could hear voices coming from one of them. But could we make one work? It sounded like the roped man. Well, none of them are the right one, but I think there's enough extra parts in here I can do a few modifications. How long? Maybe an hour. Bless you, son. This forsaken land will once again hear the word of the Holy Adam. Zin saw the roped man walk out from a door down the hall and move toward her. My child, why do you appear so weary? Your brother Justify. I've heard you on the radio in my camp. Brother Justify's smile filled with joy. What a blessing. He paused for just a moment. And what camp is that, child? The cattle ranch east of Barstown, near the old airport. Ah, yes. I've heard of your loss. May they live eternal in Adam's glow. I must bid you leave, my child, to prepare for today's sermon. There is much to celebrate. And with a flourish, Justify left the door of the radio building, leaving Zin alone to explore further. She walked down the hall to the door where Brother Justify had emerged. Peering into the door, she saw a stout man with long salt and pepper hair and a long beard to match. He was pulling wires and soldering them here and there. Behind him was a stack of electronic equipment, which he guessed was the source of the music she was hearing. Hey. The man kept working. You're the girl that Mutt saved. Or should I say the girl who saved Mutt? Yeah, I guess we helped each other out a bit this morning. Will the vacuum tubes work? They're not exactly what we need, but I'll do some modifications. We had another one being shipped from our post south of Los Angeles, but Brother Justify doesn't like to wait when it comes to his sermons. Zin felt her blood temperature rise. You already had another one coming? Well... We requested one with our last outgoing mail caravan, but it's not like it was in the old days. It could be weeks before we even hear whether they have one or not, let alone when it'll arrive. It could be, you know, whenever. The Swede finally looked up at her. Zinn grabbed at a chair in the corner of the room. She thought about how Mutt risked his life, maybe gave his life, over a couple of weeks of waiting. But of course, if he hadn't gone there to get the tubes, maybe she never would have escaped from the blood bags. The Swede went back to his work. Don't worry. Vash is the best doc outside the California Republic. Mutt's going to be fine. If he wasn't, I wouldn't be in here working on this right now. The machine the music was coming from made some mechanical noises, and a new but also familiar song started playing. The radio man looked back at her. You look tired. There's a couple cots in the room across the hall if you want to lie down for a bit. There's some MREs on the shelf and fresh food in the refrigerator. Refrigerator? <laughs> Welcome to the WCC. I'm the Swede. We'll wake you up if there's any news. Zen, and thanks. 
Zin walked across the hall. In this room, there were a pair of bunk beds and a refrigerator, just as the suite had said, along with stacks of MREs on a pair of makeshift shelves. She figured she'd had enough hundred-year-old food for one day. She opened the lower door of the refrigerator and felt a rush of cool air pour out of it. Her tribe had some old refrigerators in their camp, but they were only useful when they managed to trade for some blocks of ice from the northerners or the caravans that came down from the old Angel's Mountain Range in the winter. Zin found an apple, a couple slices of bread, which were both luxuries that many wastelanders had never tasted, and a small chunk of cheese wrapped in a cloth with the marking of a bull's head and a sickle. The marking of her own tribe. This might be the last time she'd ever taste her family's cheese. With her hands full of fresh food, she caught a sink out of the corner of her eye. Could it possibly work? She put her stash of food down on a small table and opened Mutt's bag, pulling out his empty canteen. She cautiously turned the right knob of the sink and out flowed clear water. She held out her hand and felt the cool liquid fill her palm and then turn off the tap to not be wasteful. She sniffed at the water in her hand and tasted a tiny bit. After assuring herself it was probably fine, she slurped the rest from her hand and filled the canteen to the brim before drinking most of it down. She then topped off the canteen again and took her very fine meal over to the bunk beds. She sat on the edge of the lower bunk and ate what she could, though she didn't have much of an appetite. She wished she could enjoy these rare flavors more, but she was tired and worried about Mutt. Still, there was nothing else she could do, so she laid down, closed her eyes, and tried to think of kinder days. The Ones Who Came Before was written, narrated, and directed by me, Mike Makeshift Darling. This episode features Sean Cunningham as Mutt, Mallory Trinnell as Zinn, Gavin Layton as Vash, Jet Black as Brother Justify, plus several voices by people who created these original characters, including Dukes of the Nuke, Chad Hanna as Mongo, Moses Martinez as Hardass, Megan Foster as Hotshot, Rob Green as Warchief Grimm, Tara Valhalla as Valhalla. Zach Peralto as Bacon, and WCC co-creator The Swede playing himself. Legends of Wasteland City is a production of the Apocalypse Post. Stick around after the break for more info about today's episode. Look, it's the Wasteland. If you don't have bullets, you're dead. So come on down to the Dukes of the New Armory. We've got guns, we've got bullets, we've got mortars. And really, where else are you gonna find the type of deals we can provide you? You got the caps, we've got the guns. Are you feeling lonely, bored, looking for something to do? Well, grab your riches and come on down to Undertown. We'll gladly take them off your hands and anything else you have on your persons. Please don't resist. Hello, survivors, and thanks as always for listening to today's episode. Well, if you heard that credits list, you probably figured out why this episode took just a little longer. There's 11 characters in today's episode, with 8 of them appearing for the first time. Did I bite off a little more than I can chew? No way! I'm having fun, and this story is getting better and better every chapter, and I hope you agree. Uh, so what did you think about the biggest battle sequence so far in our Legends of Wasteland City series? Hey, it's the post-apocalypse, so even though bullets are in short supply, we're gonna shoot those damn guns. When I originally wrote this story, it was one chapter, and it was just Mutt running from raiders towards the Duke's camp, and the Dukes took out the raiders like spraying wasp spray on a hive, completely overpowering the baddies. So, um, when I was starting this series and I dug out that old script, which was only, oh, maybe two minutes long, two or three pages tops, I expanded some the backstory and kept pushing it further back and further back. So now we start with Mutt scouting out the Bloodback camp. And of course, I expanded some more forward. So there's still four chapters to go, because I know I know. before we started, I said it was going to be nine chapters, but it's going to be ten. 
I couldn't couldn't leave you guys hanging without finishing the story. Anyway, so if you want to hear more big battles, just wait because our old friend Zella is not going to be happy about what just happened. So guys, a really cool thing actually happened for this episode, which is so many of the people whose characters I'm writing about stepped up and did their own voices. I'm talking Mongo, Warchief Grimm, Hotshot, Hardass, Valhalla, and Bacon, all from the Dukes with the Nuke, and the Swede from the WCC, all offered to voice their own characters, which they created the characters, I wrote the script, they voiced it, pretty cool. I kind of wrote these lines in the characters they were in, hoping to get it close, and for the most part, once they read them, uh, everything was spot on. They definitely made it their own, which is so great. And while a few of the people were able to record themselves with their home studios or with microphones I sent through the mail, um, I do have to send a huge shout out to Brett McCabe for stepping up and offering to record for all the Dukes in the LA area. It took a huge load off of me and his recordings were awesome. He's also a podcast producer and works on a comedy show called Doom Scroll. He doesn't speak on the show, but if you want to appreciate his audio mastery, his work from in the booth, check it out. It's called Doom Scroll. And it's pretty damn funny. Uh, and actually, if you go back far enough, there is an episode where he talks about Wasteland. Although I don't know which one it was. So you're going to have to listen to the whole library. But I imagine it's probably sometime in late 2021, after late September. Probably probably the first or second episode that came out in October. Maybe. I don't know. And thank you once again, Brett, for stepping up because I could not have done it without you. This was this was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the fun scenes in this episode is where Valhalla is brushing the fire ants off and partially disrobes. And I normally wouldn't write a scene where a girl just takes off her pants in front of everyone, but I originally wrote it for another male duke in that role. But I switched it after Valhalla reached out to see if I had any room for her in the story. Because everyone was getting in, she was like, I want to get involved. I was like, mm, I have this one character that was kind of written for somebody, but I can switch it. That's no problem. And I was already feeling overwhelmed with the number of characters in the story, so I just switched her in for that sniper, and I didn't change much about the scene. With a guy taking off his pants, the scene is kind of funny, a little goofy. With a girl, maybe a little inappropriate. But one of my writing rules is if you change a character's gender, it shouldn't change the way they act or think. And you can think of your own reasons for that rule. Of course, that doesn't mean 100% of the time because there are certain things that make us different, but in this case, nothing. You know, a guy taking off his pants and a girl taking off her pants, kind of the same thing when it comes to fire ants. So um, I do have to say I did okay it by her, of course, and she was totally game. And honestly, by the time it was done, I kind of pictured her a little like Vasquez in Aliens. If you guys have seen the, what is it, 1981 classic horror film Aliens? I don't know if I got that date right, but you know the one I mean. Aliens 2 with the Marines. Uh, anyway, Vasquez was tough and able to hang with the brutes and joke along with them and never really sexualized and I, I don't know, just kind of cool. So anyway, a little tribute to uh, some, some old sci-fi. With that in mind, what'd you guys think of having the Dukes and the Swede play themselves? I know for at least a few of you listening, you may know these characters in real life if you're actually a Wastelander out there and you're listening because this is written about Wastelanders. For those of you that don't know these characters, you may bump into them if you ever have the chance to visit Wasteland Weekend, which is where all these characters are based and what inspired these stories, including all Legends of Wasteland City so far. Um, and since I started this story a long time ago, it takes place when the Dukes and the Wasteland Communication Corporation were sister tribes at Wasteland and shared a camp. Judging by the interwebs, people are starting to get prepped for Wasteland Weekend 2022 already, even though the event isn't until the end of September. If you want to check it out, go to wastelandweekend.com, buy some tickets. You can also volunteer for a free ticket or, or a partial free ticket, and it's a really fun community to get involved in. If you, if you enjoy this kind of thing, outside of my fellow Wastelanders, we had Gavin Layton playing Vash and Jet Black as Brother Justify. Gavin's a fellow filmmaker friend of mine and does some occasional voiceover work, and Jet Black is a blues musician that I met here in Nashville though he and his wife are based in New Mexico. I had the chance to see Jet play in the International Blues Competition in Memphis a few weeks back, and wouldn't you know, the guy took second place in the solo duo category. So congratulations, Jet, and you guys can check out his music at jetblackblues.com. Of course, with a name like Jet Black, you gotta spell it a little weird. So it's J-H-E-T-T-B-L-A-C-K, blues, B-L-U-E-S.com. Guys, if you listen to today's episode on headphones, you may have noticed that the stereo effects were everywhere in this one. While I'm not going for fully immersive, which is also a thing, 
I do want things to feel like a movie, so where it calls for it, I like to play with moving sounds around, putting them to left and to the right, center, which is basically all my options. <laughs> <laughs> and all that basically says is I'm designing these shows to be listened on headphones. So if you're driving in the car, you may not quite get the full experience. I know when I listen to the mix in the car, the background sounds, a lot of the atmosphere can get lost in the road noise and engine, but I find making that stuff much louder can get distracting. So if you're listening in the car most of the time and you get the chance, check out an episode on headphones, especially this one, if you haven't yet. And another thought, what'd you guys think of the music in the WCC radio building, Wasteland Radio? I kind of felt like that scene was very much like a scene in Fallout. Like you walk into the space, the dialogue, it doesn't feel totally organic. And I kind of liked it that way. Uh, Cause I was trying to move things along, get a little exposition done. Um, but at the same time, I kind of like that it feels like you're following Zin on this video game. Plus we had the music in the background. We've got that old timey, oh, not doo-wop, but like an old timey jazz song. And then kind of like a sixties or seventies, almost Elvis sounding song. Uh, obviously I can't get the real songs that I want, which would be something right out of Fallout or an actual Elvis song, but uh, th these are royalty free. So they're, they're close sound alikes. Um, but did the, I want to know if it gave you the right feel. Did you get those nostalgia tingles when you got into the building and heard the radio playing? And of course, uh, loopholes, I know, the radio parts aren't there, right? So the radio shouldn't be playing, but the radio parts are actually for the broadcast system. They're not for the radio. So Swede, while he's trying to fix the broadcast system, is still jamming along to the same old music he's played a thousand times. I don't want anyone to cry plot hole on this one. Uh, I did think about it a little bit, but I... I, I figured the atmosphere would be worth it. And we also had a bit of perspective shift from Mutt to Zinn in this episode since Mutt's down for the count. Will he be back? Will he survive? Or did he make the ultimate sacrifice in saving Zinn and bringing back the radio parts? Find out in the next episode of The Ones Who Came Before. Well, that's it for this week, Survivors. Subscribe wherever you're listening. And if you liked today's episode, please share it with your friends. But if you hated it, Share it with your enemies, along with a bullet-sized hole in their gas tank. Until next time, survivors, stay alive. Oh, and one last thing, a little gift from my commanding officers. Oh, uh, hi, it's me, Makeshift, so make sure to listen to the Apocalypse Post. It's my favorite podcast on the internet. <laughs> hey, Survivors, Makeshift here to remind you that the Apocalypse Post is brought to you in no small way by our Patreon supporters. Join the ranks for early access and exclusive content with support levels now named for fancy Fallout-ridden factions like the $2 per creation Drifter or the $7 Wastelander. Knowing you've got my back has helped me dedicate more time to this channel, spreading love of the post-apocalypse, and less time on stupid real-world stuff. Sign up right now at patreon.com slash theapocalypsepost.